All right. So I'm checking the uh, audio. I'm checking the video, and everything seems to be working okay. Great. Okay. All right. So uh, I haven't seen you guys in about two weeks. So how did you guys enjoy the uh, the class being asynchronous online for the past two weeks or so? No feedback. It's all good. Better than in person or no questions. Okay. <laughs> I try my best to you know, to prepare for the lecture, like just to have everything recorded, um, just so that we don't miss anything for this class because this is a really packed class in terms of the content. So I really cannot afford to have us to lose any content, you know, just because I'm sick, and also interviews for the past week or so. So. It's just a whole bunch of stuff, you know, added together. All right, so moving ahead, <clears throat> we are going to talk about how to use the processor today. We have already talked about the components. In other words, the last lab activity that you did for this class was, you know, these two, you know, components of the processor, as well as more processor components. Uh, they were due on the same day, which is the 18th, and I believe that was last Wednesday. So do we have any questions before we continue to move on and talk about the processor itself now? Okay, I don't see any questions. Go ahead. The RAM. The RAM. So what about the RAM? I still don't know what you mean in being especially when they can't pull in Okay. Um, okay, well, so let's... Let me start up LogiSim first because you know um, everything that we talk about now, you know, LogiSim is um, one of the most useful tool. So let me go ahead and start up LogiSim first. Um, go. <clears throat> All right. So here we have LogiSim, and I believe that I gave you um, an example of how RAM operates, you know, in the video. So are the, is there a specific question about how RAM operates or just in general how it operates? You spent the notation on the uh, homework. In the homework. Yeah. Okay, so we want to visit the homework. All right, so let's visit the homework. Is it the more component, the second one, that has the RAM component in it, or is it the first one? I think the second one. The second one. Yeah, that's what I thought. <clears throat> okay. So we are going to the lab from last week, okay? So this is not about RAM, this is about the demultiplexer. And this is the one about the ROM, and this is the one about the RAM. So let's go ahead and answer these questions. Um, so to fully understand you know, this circuit here, this is also, by the way, a circuit that I talked about in the video recording. So you know, hopefully people, you know, kind of watch the video first you know, before attempting on the lab activity here. So we'll go ahead and take a look at you know what needs to be done and what are the options of getting those things done. All right, so the first one is the values of all RAM locations become zero regardless of what they start with. So there's only one thing that can do this. What would that be? Okay, let's, let's switch to the RAM component, okay? I'm switching to a LogiSim, and I'm going to the memory portion here, pick out the RAM component, and just gonna stash it here. So just visually looking at the RAM component, which port do you think is capable of clearing all the RAM locations at the same time to zeros? CLR, okay, the clear uh, port, which is this one over here. And it says you'll clear when one resets content to zero asynchronously. So that means, you know, from the perspective of the quiz or the lab, we can now say, okay, let's see which one is selecting that one. And it is known as port E in this case, or pin up input pin E connects to the clear port. So we need E to be a one. Okay, so now we look at all the options here because there may be multiple ones with E being a one. That is not the case, right? E is zero, E is zero, E is one, and then the last one says use the hook tool to poke the second row first cell from the left, and then type the letter E. 
Okay, so in this case, there, I think there's only one answer that is clear to me, that is this one. The second uh, action we want to do is to change position two in RAM to five, regardless of the previous value of that location. So this is the notation. I look at RAM as an array. So this is basically saying I want to change location two of the RAM component to five, okay, regardless of what it used to be. So once again, we click on the drop-down box and find out which one may be the answer. So we already used the one with E equals to one, so that one is gone already. So we only have the first, the second, and the last one to choose from. The last one seems to be changing something to a hexadecimal B, so that does not seem to be the correct answer. So we look at the first two. So look at the first two. Um, a is 0, 0, 1, 0. A is 1, 0, 1, 0. So now we want to know here what is input pin A connected to. So we go back to the circuit diagram here. This is input pin A. It goes to the A port. So that would seem pretty obvious to me that this is the correct answer. No, I take it back. Take that back. <clears throat> this one is addressing location two. Oh, okay. So that doesn't seem to be related to what we want to do. Location two, the address port also has zero, zero, one, zero, which is two. So it is addressing the correct location, but we can check the rest as well and see whether that makes sense or not. Now, you can also see that this one has two steps because curly braces are being used to group um, changes together into one single time frame. So this is the only one that has two different time frames. Well, the other one has two time frames too, but this one definitely has three time frames. So we have B being the clock, it went from zero to one. We also have the, um, the load pin, the LD pin, being configured as a zero, which means we are changing RAM location content as opposed to just reading RAM location. So it would seem to me that uh, the highlighted option is the correct answer. Is that okay? Where's the five in here? Because we are supposed to be changing RAM location to, to a new value of five. So five is port G. Port G is 0101, zero, one, which is 5, because that connects to the data port. The data port is what we need in order to specify what is the new content that we want the location to have. All right, so this one says, you know, RAM um, 0xA equals to 0xB. That is going to be the last one here. We are changing that location to, um, we're changing location A to the content of B in hexadecimal, okay? So this one is not using the port of the RAM to get the job done. This one is basically just going to use the poke tool, poke that location in RAM, in the RAM component, to change that location directly to the hexadecimal B. And then the last one is pin F, you know, in base two specifies the content of location zero XA, so we are reading from location A, and there's only there are two here that are reading from location A. One is this one, which is used already. This is the other one, so it has to be this one. Okay. So does that help answer the question? Okay, all right. So we are going to submit the quiz just to make sure that you know I got these four answered correctly. And let's see. Yep, I didn't bother to answer those other questions, so. Yep, so that's the correct answer. All right, any other questions about the components of the processor? There are no questions, all right. So if there are no questions about the processor, what we're gonna do today is to really take a look at the processor and we're gonna execute a single instruction. In other words, we're gonna spend about an hour to talk about how to execute a single instruction. But I cannot overemphasize the importance of today's lecture because this is going to be the way that I would think if I were a student, this is the way I'm going to, I'm going to quote unquote study for this class. Yes? Are you recording? That is a good <laughs> reminder. Yes, the voice is good. I am recording. The screen is reflecting the correct screen as well. Thank you.
Very good. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about the processor. I have Logistream up and running already, so I can go back here, and I just need to open the processor. So this is the processor that you'll be using for the rest of this entire semester. Everything that we have talked about so far is leading to this, okay? You know, this is the processor. I do not use the x86 architecture like most other colleges use um, for one reason, because the, the x86 architecture is great if you want to get a textbook, absolutely great, okay? Um, if you just want to quote unquote learn how to program, it's good too, but it doesn't really explain anything behind the code, okay? And this one, you know, the processor that you, we're gonna use here does tell you what is going on behind the scene, and that's why, you know, I think it is actually a much more useful tool. So there are a few things that I want to kind of go over. Um, <clears throat> the register bank, which is this component here, you can open it up by right-clicking on it and then go to view register bank. There are four registers inside the register bank. They are named simply as registers A, B, C, and D. That's it, okay? These are the only four software addressable registers. In other words, when you are writing your program, you can only designate one of these four registers in software. All of the other registers in the entire processor are not directly addressable from your perspective as a programmer. They are usable, but they are not directly addressable. These are the four directly addressable registers, which means in, a certain, in certain instructions, you can say, I want, you, I want to use that specific register, register C, or I want to use register B, and so on. So your code can specifically address and use one of these registers. <clears throat> Going back to the main of the processor, this is the other component that is really kind of useful. This is called the ALU. It is called the Arithmetic and Logic Unit. This is the only component of the entire processor that is capable of quote-unquote processing. What do you mean by processing? Adding, subtracting, um, doing a bitwise and, bitwise or, bitwise not, a right shift, and that's about all it can do. Okay, it cannot even, it doesn't even know how to do division or multiplication or any of the more complex operations that you would think a processor would natively know how to do. So all of those other things that are much more complex will have to be done by using multiple steps by using this ALU. All right, so having said that, there are a few other things that are really useful too. Um, do not, you don't have to worry about this. You know, we'll, your lab today will kind of help you find these documents too, but I am going to refer to those documents first. <clears throat> they are in the shared folder of this class already, which means you know these have these things have been around since the beginning of the whole class, but I haven't really talked about it. So don't worry if you have not seen it before. So you go to processors and then you go to uh, there's a table called opco table. Okay, so this is one of the resources that we'll be using today. And there's another one called the Assembler Manual, which is also good to read, okay? Maybe not today, but at some point, read it. And then the last one is called the Assembler, which is the tool that we're gonna to use to write code for the processor. So these are the resources that you might want to keep you know, around. Um, you cannot just download these pages, by the way, okay? Some of these you can, some of these you cannot. For instance, the assembler will only work as a Google Sheet. So don't even try to download it and open it in Excel because it is not going to work. Guaranteed, money back guaranteed, it will not work. Okay, if you can get it working in Excel, I'll give you money. <clears throat> All right, the other two are probably okay to download. This is just a manual, so download it as a PDF. Okay, it's good for reading. This one is just a table, okay? This one is not exactly a spreadsheet in the sense that it does any calculation. It does not do any calculation. All right, so we're gonna focus on this particular uh, Google Sheets for now, because I wanna show you one thing that I want a processor to do today in this class. The only thing I wanted to do is to do a bitwise knot of a register. 
So we focus on row 24. Okay, let me magnify this a little bit so it's easier to read just that row. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's plenty big. Okay, there we go. So let me go back and find that row 24. There we go. All right, so row 24 is our focus today because I just want to write an instruction, an opcode, in order to take the bitwise knot, or otherwise known as one's complement, from our discussion of signed versus unsigned representation of a particular register. So now we want to take a look at the four columns and understand what each column is trying to tell you. Column A is looking at things from the perspective of the processor. It is called the opcode. Column A is called the opcode. It is a bit pattern that tells the processor what needs to be done. So this ties into the whole idea of the John von Neumann architecture, because the idea of the John, the John von Neumann, or just near von Neumann architecture, is that we don't hardwire the operations of a computer. Instead, we store the instructions in the RAM, the random access memory component of the processor. This bit pattern here, 1011XX00, is what we store in RAM, so that the processor, upon inspection of this opcode here, will understand, oh, so you want to take the bitwise knot of a particular register and then store the bitwise knot back into the same register. So that's what column A is representing. It is from the perspective of the processor. Column B is what we call the mnemonic, M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C, okay, mnemonic, which is really just an abbreviation of the operation that's easier for people to remember as well as to type, okay? So some of these are pretty obvious, like add is for adding, okay, that's really obvious. Some of these are not as obvious, like LDI is load immediate. What does it mean by load immediate, right? Um, there's also RSH for right shift. So there's a convention to use as few letters as possible when we describe the operation as a mnemonic. Why? I mean, would it really kill us you know, to spell out J-U-M-P as opposed to J-M-P? No. But when you are writing code on, a, on punch cards, then yes, not having to punch one extra row on the punch card really helps a lot. So this is how you know this is how old assembly language programming is, is it traces its root all the way back to the days of punch cards. Okay? So the second row or the second column, column B, is called the mnemonic, which is a very abbreviated way for us to remember what the instruction does. So there's a there's a process, okay? If you are saying I'm not gonna program you know, the, the processor using binary bit patterns, I prefer to use mnemonic, great. That's what the assembler is for. The assembler is a translator to go from column B to column A, okay? So what about column C? Column C is a description of what is the processor going to do when it executes the opcode described in column A. In other words, it is telling you what is being done, okay? It's not the opcode, it is the actual operation. So in this case, we can see that x equals to the tilde, which is bitwise not, of x here. What is x here, okay? So we'll go back to the, the beginning of the spreadsheet to, you know, when we need to look at what is what x is representing. And then column D is just a word verbal description of the operation. So in this case, it's just performing bitwise not. Do we have any questions about what each column is representing and or how they relate to each other? Column A, from the perspective of the processor itself. Column B, for the most part, from the perspective of the developer, programmer, your coder, however you want to call that person. Column C is an explanation of what the opcode is going to accomplish when the processor executes it. And then column D is really just a much more verbal English description of the operation. So those are the four um, columns you know, for this particular Google Sheet. Any questions before we proceed? 
What is what is PC? PC is the program counter. So we'll get to the program counter very soon because you know, it is in it's crucial to the execution of any instruction. Okay, the program counter is also known as the instruction pointer. So if you're coming from an Intel background, Intel likes to call the program counter the IP or the instruction pointer. So if you want to correlate the terms, you know, this is one way you can correlate to terms that you might have understood from taking from other classes prior to this one. All right, so let's go back to the beginning of the spreadsheet here because that part is also important. It talks about how XX is a bit pattern to specify one of the four registers. If you want register A, you use 00. zero. If you want to use register B, you use 01 and so on. So that means if I go back to row 24, if what I want to do is to take the existing content of register B, perform a bitwise not, and then store the bitwise not or the negated result back into register B, then I specify B in place of X. X is a placeholder of a register. XX, on the other hand, in column A, is the bit representation of that very same register. So if I want to use register B, if I want to say not B over here in column B, then column A needs to specify 1011-0100. So do we have any questions about how to utilize this table in order to figure out the exact opcode you know, once you have selected which register to use for some of these instructions? Okay, if there are no questions, what I'll do is I am going to use mouse pad to remember on the side of what we want to do. This is coming from my other class on you know, Thursday. So we're going to change it a little bit. Instead of using register C, we're going to use register B, which means the bit pattern is no longer one zero, it is zero one zero zero. <coughs> and I will go ahead and <clears throat> I think I'll keep all of this up here, but I have not explained it yet, okay? So we'll get to that point in just a little bit. And then the actual instruction in mnemonics also need to be changed because we are negating uh, register B and not register C. So this one is for this class only, but if you watch the video from last Thursday, you know, you will see the description of the alternate um, instruction. <clears throat> Are we doing okay so far with this discussion? Okay, all right. <coughs> I'm tested negative already, but the cough is going to stay with me for a while. All right, so this is the mnemonic. This is the opcode. And this is the, uh, what we call the register transfer language to describe what is actually happening. Does everybody understand what the tilde operator means? What is bitwise not? Okay, we're good. <coughs> it is also known as once complement. <coughs> All right, so what we'll do now is try to execute the instructions. <coughs> So to do this, you have two ways to do it. So I'm going to show you how to use the assembler to get this done. This is the assembler. And in the assembler, there is one tab or one sheet that is called the source tab or the source sheet. This is where you put in the code. Okay. So what you can do, you know, for this class, you know, at least you know, for the moment, we can now just you know, specify the instruction. It is not B followed by a halt instruction. The halt instruction is actually necessary because without a halt instruction, the processor will keep trying to go to the next location and execute the opcode at the next location. Once you get this part done, you can go to the assemble view, which is really good for understanding you know, the assembler, but most of the time you do not really need to go to the assemble view when you're writing code, but when you're starting off, 
This is actually a pretty useful view. Column W is telling you what is the address of the other bytes, okay, which are in column X and column Y. So this is telling you that the B4 of column X is at location 00. zero. The byte you know, with the content of zero 01 is at location zero 01, and so on. So it, it basically tells you that the assembler is working. Not B as a mnemonic is translated into B4. What is B4? <clears throat> B is 1011, 4 is 0100. Hey, that sounds awfully still familiar because that's exactly the same bit pattern that we have specified here, only to be represented in hexadecimal. Is that okay so far? Does everybody see how the hexadecimal uh, number B4 is really the same opcode that we have been talking about since the beginning of this class? Okay, all right. <clears throat> all right, so now you have to get the program into the RAM of the processor. Now, since we only got two bytes here, one is B4 and one is 01, you can just kind of poke it into the RAM component in the processor, but you can also save you know, the RAM file, okay? Go to the RAM file tab here, go to file, and then go to download, and then go to um, save as a CSV, that you can do too. So you can go here, go to download, go to save as, or download as a comma separated value file, and then it will tell you, it will ask you, my browser is set up to do this, but yours is probably not. So it's just gonna save it with a particular default name. So in this case, I'm just gonna save it as not.csv, which is already there. I'm going, I'm going to replace that file in my temp folder. So that's one way to do it. <clears throat> and if you're concerned about not being able to write down things you know, fast enough you know, for you know, what I'm doing right now, the steps are already included in the lab for today. So you know, don't be too concerned that you have to write down everything. And the recorder is up and running, the voice is good, the screen is up and running as well. So I'm double checking you know, just you know, a few times to make sure that everything is still being recorded. Okay, so since we only got two positions, you know, B4 and 01, I can just go to the processor and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here because otherwise it gets a little bit more difficult to navigate. So I go to the RAM component and I'm just gonna use the poking tool. <coughs> type in the value for these locations. So for location 00, we want B4, and then for location 01, we want a 01 over here. So all I did was just to type on the keyboard while the red rectangle is circling around the location that I just clicked on, but you have to remember to use the poking tool in order to select the location to be changed. <clears throat> Are we doing okay so far? Okay, all right. So now we are ready to execute you know, this particular program, which doesn't do a whole lot. <clears throat> all right, so where do we start? I mean, <coughs> <coughs> the processor is fairly complex, okay? So when you look at the entire processor, it's a big mess of wires and tunnels and multiplexers, demultiplexers, and so on. So the way we start is always starting at the bottom portion of the entire processor. This is also called the controller part of the processor. It is the, if you think about the processor as an, as an orchestra with many different types of musical instruments, individual musicians and whatnot, this portion here is representing the conductor. So the conductor provides both timing as well as control over you know, which instrument should play, which two instruments should talk to each other, and so on and so forth, okay? <clears throat> so now that we focus on the bottom part here, we're gonna zoom in a little bit so that I can talk about you know, the register that starts everything. It's called the microcode pointer. So the U in front of the code is an approximation of the Greek symbol mu, which is, it looks like a funny looking P, a cross between the P and the U, okay? But it is the uh, Greek letter mu. <coughs> 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 
which in engineering is representing the unit of micro, which is 10 to the power of negative six. So the micro code pointer is a register. <coughs> Excuse me. How do we know it's a register? Because when you poke on it, it says it is a register. It is a register that has 12 data bits. It has a trigger of falling edge, which means it only updates when the clock is on a falling edge. <clears throat> so the, this is the D port, this is the Q port. <coughs> this is the input, this is the output. This is the enable, okay? The enable is connected to a constant of one, which means the register is constantly enabled. But it doesn't update until there's a falling edge on the clock line, which is this little icon here. The clock line has a little, <coughs> has a little wedge symbol representing itself, you know, representing the clock port. And then there's also a clear port here, which is the same thing as a CLR port of the RAM, except this one resets just for this register. <clears throat> so this is the reason why we talked about the SR latch, the D flip-flop, the level-sensitive D flip-flop, the edge-sensitive D flip-flop, <clears throat> the resettable D flip-flop, and so on, is because you know when we combine D flip-flops, <coughs> Into a register, it becomes one of the most useful components inside the processor because it is capable of remembering not only a single bit, not a single zero or one, but multiple bits. It is basically a gang of D flip flops. Okay. <clears throat> the output of the micro code pointer goes to the A port of this ROM over here. So this ROM is also special. If you click on this ROM here, you will see that the address bit width is 12, which means there are 4,096 locations to it. <clears throat> but each location also has a very odd number of bits because each location has 26 bits. It's not eight, it's not 16, it's not 32. It is a really kind of odd ball number, which is 26. <clears throat> Just like the micro code pointer, you can also see how the select pin or the select port of ROM is always enabled. In other words, this ROM is always going to spill out whatever content is being addressed. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion? The micro code pointer, okay, always start the analysis with the micro code pointer. It points to a certain location in ROM. The content at that location of ROM is going out of the D port of ROM, which then splits into a bazillion tunnels. And those tunnels are going into the various components of the processor, which we'll start to analyze soon. But at this point, are we okay so far? You know, where to start the analysis? The micro code pointer going into the ROM, and then we want to know what is coming out of the ROM, which are the 26 bits that we are seeing out of this port over here. <clears throat> are we good so far? Okay, all right. So now that we know that we are at location 000, we are about to have a rising edge because clock is a zero at this point. So when I type control T on the keyboard, it's going to give us a rising edge. So now the question is, um, how do we get started analyzing this part here? This is such a big, huge mess. Well, it is. it looks like a big mess, okay? But there are only a few things that are capable of storing or doing something. <clears throat> so this is where you might want to jot down some notes, okay? Because, you know, there are only a few things. All, only the registers are really helpful in, in, in your analysis. So you look at all the registers. One is called the program counter that we talked about just briefly a little bit earlier. The program counter is a pointer pointing to the next location to get an opcode out of RAM. In other words, it is storing the address in RAM of where are we supposed to get the next opcode to execute. That is the job of the program counter. 
<clears throat> in an Intel architecture, the program counter is also called the instruction pointer. So when you see the term instruction pointer in a different context, it really means the same thing as a program counter in this class. Are we good so far? Okay. Um, another component that can store something is called the instruction register. The instruction register is a temporary register that I need in order to store the opcode that is going to be executed. Okay? It's not used nearly as often as the program counter, but nonetheless, it is significant. It is useful in the processor. <clears throat> and then we have the four registers inside the register bank that you really cannot see from the outside. Well, you can, but it's not exactly the same thing. Because if you look at the output out of the register bank, it actually reflects the, the value of register A, register B, register C, as well as register D. This is a convenience feature so that we don't have to right click on the register bank just to find out what are the values of the registers. So it's a convenience feature, but if you want to look into the register bank, you right click, you go to view register bank, and here we can see register A, Register B, register C, and also register D. And then we also have another component that is really helpful or useful in many instructions. It is the RAM itself, okay? So here's the RAM itself, right here. All right, so how many things have I just identified? The program counter, the instruction register, the four software addressable registers, A, B, C, and D. Um, so that makes you know, six uh, registers. Uh, we have the RAM, seven components. Yeah, we do have another register here called the flags register, but that's not gonna, gonna come in handy until much later, okay? So altogether, we can count less than 10 things that are actually of importance, okay? So one thing that you might wanna do is to print out the entire processor on a sheet of paper. And then all you need to do is to get a highlighter, okay, and then highlight the things that I have just mentioned. The program counter, the instruction register, um, the micro code pointer down there, the RAM, okay, and also the instruction, the register bank, okay. So highlight those things because, you know, those are the first things that you need to look into when you're trying to figure out what is happening now, okay. So can someone tell, can someone tell me uh, what is happening to RAM? Should I pay attention to RAM at all? Is it being utilized right now at this moment? <clears throat> and how can we find out whether RAM is being used or not? Which one single port of the RAM component is the key to answer that particular question? of whether RAM is being utilized at right now or not. Yep. The select port, exactly. So the select port, which is right here, is the key. Because if RAM itself is not, is not being utilized, then the select is gonna be a zero, okay? The fact that the select is one means that, hmm, I probably need to take a closer look at how RAM is being utilized at this moment. <clears throat> okay, so what would be your next question now that you know RAM is being utilized? There should be three additional questions, but the ordering may or may not be the same as the, one, the, the way I'm gonna order them. But go ahead, okay, tell me what are the next few questions that you have to ask when you know, oh, okay, so if RAM is being used, I really need to answer those additional questions. <clears throat> okay, so let me go take a step back and kind of talk about how can you possibly know what questions to ask, okay? To me, it is a visual thing. Because once we know RAM is being utilized, because the select is a one and not a zero, I'm gonna ask, what about the other ports? What are they gonna do when RAM is being used? What is the purpose of the A port? What is the purpose of the D port? What about the load port over here? What are they gonna do? Those would be the natural questions because as soon as you know a component is active, is being used right now at this moment, 
You then you look at all the ports. It's like, what are these things? What do they do? How do I know what they're supposed to be doing? Is that okay? All right, because I want you guys to develop a habit of being able to ask those questions by yourselves. Okay. Okay. So I just kind of go around the ports and ask. Um, okay, RAM can do one of two things. I can read the content of a location from RAM, or I can change the content at a certain location in RAM. So one of the earliest questions you might want to ask is, am I reading or am I writing to RAM? So what do you think? That particular answer can be done. You can answer that question by a visual inspection right now. So am I reading from RAM or am I writing to RAM at this point? Which port controls that? Am I really supposed to remember things that I did last Thursday in that lab? The answer is yes. That's the whole idea of that lab, is to get you guys to read about the ports of RAM and understand which one controls the reading versus the writing. It's the load port, LD, okay? So when you highlight the LD port here, it even tells you by hovering over that a one specifies we are loading memory to output, which is the D port, okay? So is it a one right now? Yes, it is, okay? So that means we are reading from RAM. All right, so we have just answered one of the questions. We are, RAM is being used, we are reading from RAM. So that should prompt two additional questions like right away in your head, okay? Because you have to ask the question, which location am I reading from? And who cares about the content at that location? Who's paying attention? So those are the two follow-up questions once we know that we are reading from RAM. One question at a time. Who is telling me which location to read at this point? How do I figure that out? What do I track now? <clears throat> which port do I track down to understand who is telling me which location is being read at this point? The A port? The A port, the address port. Very good. So we track down the A port here, okay? This is where the, uh, the poking tool is really helpful because when you poke on a wire, it highlights the entire node. So now we see Okay, the A port is coming out of this multiplexer. Okay, a multiplexer is a switch, okay, like a railroad switch. In this case, it has two input and one output. So at this point, how do I continue my analysis? I just know that at this point, the multiplexer, the output of this multiplexer is driving the A port of RAM, but um, can I go any further than that? If so, how do I go any further? than this. How do I figure out what is really trying to specify the A port at this point? <clears throat> well, a multiplexer has two input in this case and one single output. How do I figure out which input connects to the output for the multiplexer that we are paying attention right now? What is the significance of the gray dot on the multiplexer or the multiplexer? It has a specific name. What is that name? It is the select port, okay? This is the port that specifies which input connects to the output. So if you go to here, I'm not sure whether the, no, if the hovering does not tell me, but it is the select port. So the select port being a one means that input one is now connecting to the output. Are we good so far? This is the whole reason why we did the lab on last Thursday, because now we know, or we are supposed to know, how the individual components in the processor is supposed to function, okay? So now we say, oh, okay, great. So that means we need to track down input one to the multiplexer. Okay, this is input one to the multiplexer. Click on this wire, and it connects to several points. This is not an output from an adder. This is the output of a program counter. So this is how we know that right now, 
the program counter, the output of the program counter connects to the A port of RAM. The program counter is telling the processor to read from location 00, zero in RAM. Are we okay so far? Just figuring out you know, who is determining the, determining the location from which we are reading from. <clears throat> is that okay? All right. So now we try to answer the other question, okay, which is, all right, cool. The content at location 00, zero is now presented on the output port, which is the D port. The question is, who's paying attention, okay? Because, you know, I'm going to guess that somebody is paying attention to the D port of RAM, because otherwise, why would I turn on RAM and specify to be in reading mode if nobody is paying attention, right? So it makes sense that somebody should be listening to you know, the D port of RAM. The question is, who is paying attention? So once again, we track down all of these connections, okay? So this is kind of like a maze, right? So you look at this port over here, you this wire go all the way over here, and then you end up at this multiplexer here. Should I continue with tracking down this multiplexer any further? The answer is no, I don't have to track it down any further because the multiplexer has a select of zero, which means the output of this multiplexer is not even related to the D port of RAM. Okay, so my analysis can stop right here. This is a dead end for that particular analysis. So now we track down all of the other places where the node ends up with, what, what about here? That's not even an input. This is the output of a demultiplexer. And the demultiplexer is off by the way, so that means, ah, uh, it's another dead end. Okay, we don't have to worry about this part. Where else is it going? Ah, uh, it's going into this instruction register here. Should I pay attention, okay? Is there anything important here? Look at the instruction register. What do you notice about the instruction register? Look at the bright green line going into the instruction register. Where is it going? Where is the green line going into from the perspective of the instruction register? <clears throat> Okay, it's, the name is already spelled out, right, on the component, but if you want to, you can always kind of hover over here and see that, oh, this is the enable port, when zero clock register, what, what does it say? When zero clock triggers are ineffective, or not being used, but it's a bright green, which means it is one, which means the register is enabled. It's waiting for a, a clock transition. But what kind of a clock transition are we talking about? It's a rising edge, because all the registers are sensitive to rising edge, except for the microcode pointer. That is the only register that is sensitive to a falling edge. This one is sensitive to a rising edge, which is about to happen, because the clock going into the register is darkening, which means when I type control T on the keyboard, it's, gonna, it's going to give me a rising edge. Is that okay? All right. So all I have done so far is to track down every single component that is going to do something in this at this particular instant of time. And going back to the uh, mouse pad here, this is called a fetch cycle. What I have just described is called the fetch cycle. So what I'm using here to kind of document what the fetch cycle is doing is to specify IR is the instruction register. It is being updated by whatever the program counter is pointing to and be referenced it in RAM. So I'm using the C notation that you have learned in CISP 360 as a part of the register transfer language to describe exactly what is going on inside the processor. <clears throat> what you see here as a right, this is the R, right? R is a rising edge, okay? So I have just described a portion of what the fetch cycle is doing. So let us switch to the um, logic sim again. So I'm gonna type control T on the keyboard. Can someone tell me what you are expecting to see in the instruction register as soon as I type control T? You can specify your answer in a few ways, okay? You can see, you can say that it's gonna update 
to the opcode of blah, blah, okay? You can say it's gonna update to the content of location, blah, blah. So all of those are fine, okay? So try to answer that question in your head, or if you want to give me the answer in class, that's fine as well. Does anyone want to tell me what's gonna happen when I type control T on the keyboard? <clears throat> to help you answer the question, you might find a view of the RAM component to be useful. So, now they can see the RAM component and, you know, and the connectivity <coughs> that we just analyzed. <coughs> what do you think is going to be the new content of the instruction registers? B4, very good, okay. So control T. So now the instruction register has the opcode, okay? B4 is the opcode that we think should take the bitwise knot or the logical knot of the register B and then store it back into the register B. So now it's in this instruction register. The next thing is gonna be a falling edge because the clock is high at this point. So the next edge is gonna be a falling edge. And there's only one thing that is sensitive to a falling edge, and that is the microcode pointer. So when you're on a falling edge, forget about the rest of the processor. There's only one register that is sensitive to a falling edge. So now we want to understand what is going to go on, what is happening when I have the next falling edge. So the next falling edge is going to update the microcode pointer because the microcode pointer is always enabled, okay? and the clock is gonna fall you know, at this point. So now I have to understand how is it gonna be updated? So these are the kind of questions that you really should ask yourselves is when you see a register being enabled, the natural question to ask is, how is it getting the value that we are gonna to use to update it? Okay, that is gonna be the very natural question to ask. So in, to answer the question, we looked at the deport because that's the input into the register. It is the, connected to the output of a multiplexer. That's okay, because we know the behavior of a multiplexer. It's a multi-input, one single output kind of switch, which means we just have to look at the gray dot here to find out what is the select port specifying. It's a bright green, which means it's using input one to connect to the output. We track down input one. It's coming out of the adder over here. Now, if you say, but we haven't really talked about the outer component, that's fine. You know, we can just click on this and, okay, come on. Okay, I cannot do that. Okay, use the selection tool and it tells me this is an adder. It has a data bit width of 12. What is it adding? One thing we're adding is the current value of the microcode pointer itself. The other one is adding is C in, which is equivalent to our K zero when we talked about binary addition. And then the actual number that is adding to the adding to the value of the register is zero. But that's okay because all we want to do is just to add one. So you can specify a one as the other input or you specify a one as your carry in. Both would do exactly the same thing, which is really just adding one to whatever the microcode pointer has. <clears throat> So that means you know, when we have a falling edge right now, the microcode pointer is going to update to it's currently 0, 0, 0, which is presented to one of the inputs of the adder. The adder adds 1 to that input. It outputs 0, 0, 1. The 0, 0, 1 goes all the way around back into the multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select port that specifies that 0, 0, 001 should go back into the D port of the microcode pointer. So upon a falling edge, what do you think is going to be the new content of the microcode pointer? 0, 0, 001. Okay, so it's an auto increment mechanism, which means we now address the next location in ROM. Okay, so now we go back. And we try to analyze what's going to go on with this particular in, at this particular instant of time. We are about to have a rising edge because clock is low at this point. So the next control T is going to have a rising edge. So we go through the same exercise as last time. And we can start with RAM again. So 
This time, should I pay attention to RAM? Is it going to do something? No, no. The RAM select is a zero, which means you know it's not doing a single thing. Fine. Okay. Move on to some other stuff then. <clears throat> You can see the flex register also has it enabled being a zero. Uh, the instruction register has its input being a zero. So, oh wait, but the program counter has the enable being a one. So the program counter is about to be updated on the rising edge. So what, again, what is the natural next question to ask now that we know that the program counter is going to update? Who is, yeah, go ahead. What is it updating to? Very good, okay? So I want you guys to develop this habit, okay? To be able to ask yourselves the next question and be able to answer that question, okay? So the program counter is going to update. It's always going to update using the D port. We follow the D port back to this multiplexer, but this time the multiplexer has a select of zero, which means input zero connects to the D port, we follow input zero for the, of the multiplexer, and we encounter about the same kind of mechanism, which is really just an auto-incrementing mechanism, which means the program counter is about to update to zero one. Is that okay? Okay. So now we have another control T, a rising edge, and we can see the program counter just auto-incremented from zero, zero to zero one. Now this is kind of important because it completes the entire highlighted line at this point. This is called the fetch cycle. The fetch cycle consists of a rising edge, falling edge, and then another rising edge, while, and it starts with the micro code pointer being at zero, zero, zero. The whole purpose of the fetch cycle when we execute an instruction is the whole idea of the von Neumann architecture. Go to RAM, get me the opcode that I'm supposed to execute. That's what the fetch cycle is supposed to be. <clears throat> okay? Now, has it executed the instruction and has it changed the register? No. This is all it wants to do is to go find me that opcode. I'll determine what to do next. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> So if I switch back to the processor right now, the next uh, edge is going to be a falling edge. So the falling edge only affects the micro code pointer, so we switch back to the micro code pointer. This is going to be a falling edge. So how is the micro code pointer going to be updated? Same question, but different answers this time. The D port is still coming out of the, mic the multiplexer. Okay, that has not changed. But the select has changed. Okay, the select of the multiplexer is now a dark green, which means it's using port zero or input zero. Input zero is interesting because it's coming out of a splitter or a merger in this case. Okay, what is it saying? Okay, this is the reason why you know I had Logisim zoom in so much earlier, is to take a look at the splitter so that we can better understand what is going in to the D port of the micro code pointer. You can see that bit zero to bit three are coming from a constant of zero. So that means whatever wire is connected to the input zero of the multiplexer will be just zero, 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 zero. Those are the least significant four bits of the 12 bits going into the multiplexer. Hardly exciting, okay? What about the other bits? Bit four to bit 11 is coming out of the tunnel that we call instruction. And where did that come from? That came straight out of the instruction register. So that means bit zero of the instruction register becomes bit four of the new value of the micro code pointer. Bit one of the instruction register becomes bit five of the micro code pointer and so on. Is that okay? So we take the entire re instruction register, we put four additional zeros to the least significant side, and then we shift everything to the other side. Okay, from your perspective, it's shifting that way. Okay. <clears throat> so can someone tell me, after the falling edge, what is going to be the new content in the microcode pointer? Now that we know the instruction register is D4, we are basically padding 
0, 0, 0, 0 in base 2 have the least significant 4 bits. So what is going to be the new content of the microcode pointer when I type control P on the keyboard? So the way we work this out is like this, okay? So you can work it out on the piece of paper if you wish to do that, okay? So we know the instruction vectors that permanently have the value of 0x b4, which is the same thing as in binary, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0 in base 2, right? Okay? So what <clears throat> we are going to put into the microcode pointer, okay, so the microcode pointer is going to get the same bit over here with four additional zeros like that. So let's do some counting just to make sure that we are counting the bits correctly. Bit zero to three, they are the new zeros, okay? This is bit four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh, that's just you know, whatever the instruction register has. So in terms of in hexadecimal, what do you think this is gonna look like in terms of the <clears throat> microcode pointer in hexadecimal, what does it look like? Go like, mm, isn't that the same thing just as the original B4, right? 1011 zero, one, one is a B, zero, 0100 zero, zero is a 4, and we just have one additional zero all the way to the right hand side. Yeah, that's exactly what it's supposed to have. B40, that's going to be the new value in the microcode pointer. Okay, so now we switch back to here, and I'm going to type Control T on the keyboard. Focus on the content of the microcode pointer here. Okay, Control T. Aha, B40. Okay, just as we predicted. This is important. Okay, because what we just did is called a decode cycle when you execute an instruction, and that's why in the uh, in the uh, comments over here. Okay, let me just add a few more slashes here. And that's why this is called a decode cycle. The decode cycle can be described as changing the microcode pointer so that it is in the instruction register left shifted by four bits, which is exactly the same thing as multiplying it by 16. <clears throat> Are we good so far with the decode cycle? So the first step is Oh, go to the library, you know, fetch me one page of a manual of teaching me how to do something. That's just walking to the library, going through the aisle, finding the book, making a photocopy, and bring me back that one page. That's the fetch cycle. The decode cycle is me looking at that page and go like, uh, okay, okay, I know how to configure the processor now, tweak this, do this over here, and so on. That's the decode cycle. So now, when we go back to the processor, you can see how the location at B40 is now being addressed. So all of these bits here, okay, because remember, each hexadecimal digit is corresponding to four bits. So the 26 bits as the output from the B4 is now telling the processor to do one particular thing. And we want to know what it is, okay? So now we switch to the upper portion because we are about to have a rising edge. So the rising edge always has to do with the upper portion of the processor. So we go through the same exercise that we did before. We can see the RAM is turned off, okay? So we don't have to pay attention to RAM at all. Uh, we go to the program counter. It is also not enabled, which means it's not gonna update. We look at the instruction register. It is also not enabled. But hey, hold on a second here. We see some green, bright green lines, okay? One is right here, okay? So it looks like we're gonna do something with the register bank, okay? It looks like some of the output of the register bank is also gonna be active because this demultiplexer is now enabled. And we can also see the enable of the ALU is now bright green as well. So it sounds like, hmm, something is happening to the registers. Um, it is going to feed some output to the ALU and we're gonna to have to find out exactly what's gonna happen next. Are we good so far with the analysis? Okay, so we can start with the register bank, okay? So we can take a closer look at the register bank. So there are two things that we have to track down is 
One is, um, I think something is going to get updated because you know one of the four registers, A, B, C, and D, has the input or the enable port being a one. Okay, it's register B. Okay, that's not unexpected because we are expecting to update register B. The question is how. Well, it is coming out of the decoder here. A decoder is basically the same thing as a demultiplexer, except the input is constantly a one. That's the only difference between a decoder and a demultiplexer. A decoder is basically a demultiplexer that has a constant one as an input. It has its own enable, okay, which is a one at this point, and it has its own select, which is zero one. So that means only zero one as an output is enabled, and that's why we have you know register B being enabled. It is going to be updated on the rising edge. So that's one thing that we observe. The second thing that we observe is uh, whatever out zero is, is now going to the demultiplexer. The demultiplexer is enabled at this point, and the select is telling us that zero one as an output is the, this is the output. Output zero one connects to the input, you know, according to the select port. So now my question is, what is outputting to out zero from the register bank? So we go back into the register bank and we look at register output zero and then we track it down backwards and try to figure out which register is connected to register output zero. Okay, it goes into this multiplexer here. This multiplexer has a select of zero one, which means input one connects to the output here and that input one connects to the output of register B. So after all these analyses, we now understand that register B will be updated on the rising edge. The same register connects to output zero of the register bank. And then when we go to the outside of the register bank, this output zero connects to the multiplexer here. The multiplexer connects the input to the output here. So now we get to the ALU, the arithmetic and logic unit. Are we still doing okay so far with all this tracking? Now, if you say, I cannot remember all the steps, I cannot remember the names of all those your tunnels and ports and whatnot, it's okay, okay? It's, it's all here, okay? You're gonna have access to this file. This is what's gonna be something that you'll be working with for the rest of the semester. The big question is, do you understand how I did the analysis? Now, if you say, yeah, sort of, you know, but the details is kind of fuzzy, it's okay. It's okay to have the details a little bit on the fuzzy side, but it's the method that is important. Okay. All right. So now we go to the ALU. Okay. We know in one is being used. We know EN is enabled. So now we go here and try to say, okay, what's going on inside the ALU? All right. So we know in one is connected to register B. So now the next question is, oh, looks like we can hook it up to one of these things over here, but how do we know which one is hooking up to? So what we do is we, we hook on the select port, which specifies 011, which is a three. So that means output three of the demultiplexer is connected to the input. This is input, output zero, output one, output two, this is output three. So we track it down to, guess what? A NOT gate. Okay, because we are performing a bitwise NOT operation, kind of makes sense that the input of the ALU connects to just a NOT gate. Okay, so now we know, okay, what is happening after the NOT gate? Well, continue our tracking. It goes into a multiplexer, okay? So that means, um, are you really sure this input of the multiplexer connects to the output of the ALU? Well, we can track it down, okay? Because we can track down the gray dot here, which is the same select port, and it is also with, uh, it's also specified as a three. So that means, yeah, we are taking the output of the NOT gate because it is input three of the multiplexer, and we are connecting input three of the multiplexer to the output of the ALU itself. All right, are we... Are you guys still kind of with me in terms of the process? Okay. 
Now, when you look at this and go like, uh, but I really cannot see which part is which part because this is an exploded view of the ALU. How do I know which part seen from the outside is which part over here? You switch to the appearance mode here, and then all you have to do is to click on one of these things like, okay, who is the output port? Okay, as soon as I can click on that pin, there we go. You see how in the picture in picture, this is the port that we just looked at earlier. So this is how you can map what is on the appearance of a component to the actual port that is inside the circuit itself. All of this stuff here we have done already in some of the earlier labs. Okay, so the, all of those earlier labs really kind of help to add up to this point. Okay, so we have this output being the negation of V at this point. Where is it going? This one turns out not to be going anywhere other than the multiplexer over here. Okay, it's a multiplexer. Are we even sure that this input is relevant? Okay, well, yes, we are. One, this multiplexer is enabled, okay? It connects to RIEN, which is an ena en enabled. And two, the select is RI mod still, which is also a one, which means input one of this multiplexer connects to the output, which is going into the in port of the register bank. So now we go back into the register bank. This is a full circle. We track down register input as a port, and it goes like, uh, but... We are not updating all four registers at the same time, are we? No, we are not, because only one of them has the EN or the enable being a one. All of the other ones have the EN being zeros. So this is the purpose of the EN port, is to allow us to have a multi-drop connection like this, where multiple things, multiple registers in this case, connect to exactly the same node, but only one is being selected to, up, to update. Are we doing okay so far? So when we, you know, obviously you can see that the, uh, the value of the node that we are looking at right now are all ones. It makes sense, right? Because register B is all zeros. So the bitwise not of all zeros would be all ones. So that is gonna be the new content of register B when I type control T on the keyboard. So here we go, control T. And you can see how register B now becomes FF, which is the hexadecimal specification of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So now we go back to main. We go, because the next edge is going to be a falling edge again. So now we go all the way back down to look at the microcode pointer. So this is back to the auto increment mode, because we can see how input one of the multiplexer is being used to update the microcontroller. This is coming out of the app. But the result of this operation is not what you expect. <clears throat> that has to do with what is at location B41. Okay, so if we go to edit content of the ROM, okay, I need to move that window from one side to the other because it always opens up the uh, this window on the wrong side. So now we go to B41 as a location. So B41, there we go. B41 is, this is B40. Now remember, the italicized number on the left-hand side of each row is the address of the first byte of the leftmost location on that row. So that means B40 is describing the address of the um, highlighted location. The next location is two followed by all zeros. Is that okay? So just remember that. It's all two followed by six zeros. I'm going to close this window here. So now we're trying to execute that instruction in our head. It's a 26-bit output here. Okay? This is a 26-bit output, which means bit 25 is going to be the most significant binary digit. Right? Okay. So you have... We have six zeros in hexadecimal. Each zero in hexadecimal translates to four bits, you know, four zeros in binary. Okay? So six zeros is going to account for 24 of the bits. The remaining two will be bit 24 and bit 25. Okay, this is bit 24, this is bit 25. 
So that two that we saw earlier is basically saying bit 25 is going to be a one. All right? So that is significant because what is, where is bit 25 going? Bit 25 is going into, what is this gate again? Sorry? It's an OR gate, okay? So if at least one input of the OR gate is a one, what is the output? One. It's a one. And where is that one going into? What is this port of a register? That port of a register is documented by a single digit of zero. What do you think it's going to do? It's going to clear. Exactly. It is the same thing as CLR of RAM. It clears the content of the register, which means when I type Control T on the keyboard, it's going to trigger a falling edge. The falling edge is going to eventually put a zero, put a one into the clear port, which means the micro pointer is going to reset to zero, zero, zero. It goes all the way back to the fetch cycle because we are done executing one opcode at this point. Okay? You won't see a micro code pointer changing to B41 because the amount of time is so short that we cannot see it. So control T. And you can see how it goes straight back to 000, which means we are now ready to fetch the next opcode. That completes one single you know, cycle of executing a single instruction. Okay? <clears throat> so I know we are almost running out of time, but I do want to point out a few things that are important, not only for the lab today, but also for what you should be doing before Wednesday. So these instructions come in families, okay? Uh, your lab today is gonna focus on one of the other instructions. What I expect people to do in this class is to go through the same exercise, but with other instructions, okay? So we have just gone through, you know, not B as an instruction. What I want you guys to do is to track down the execution of some other opcode um, that is related, but not exactly the same. So you can try add BC, okay? So try out, you know, add BC as an instruction to execute and find out exactly how the connectivity is established between register B, register C, and also the ALU, and also to go through the entire process so that you understand, you know, better how the processor gets its job done. How do we fetch? How do we get to the location where the instruction is located? Where do we put it, okay? Once we know where it is, you know, where do we put it? We put it into the instruction register, and then how do we know how to configure the rest of the processor so that we can carry out the actual instruction? That's the decode cycle, okay? We change the micro code pointers based on the opcode. That's the decode. After the decode, then we can see the connectivity between register B, register C from the register bank going to the ALU, and then it loops back to register B so the register B gets updated by the value, by the sum of registers B and C, okay? So I can only say it, okay, because I don't want to turn it into a homework assignment, but do exactly what I did in today's class, okay? Now, do you want to... Watch the, watch the video on one side and do it on your own on the other side, I would probably recommend not to do that, okay? I would recommend you just going through the video, absorb the way that I get it done, and then do it on your own, okay? Because as you do it on your own, you will have to kind of remind yourself, okay, what is the next question? What should I look at next, okay? How do I figure this part out? What is being active? What is, what is the processor doing right now? I see that register is enabled. How is it getting updated? So you have to kind of go through all of those questions in your head as you go through this entire exercise. That is how I envision the class or the material to be studied at this point of this class. All right? <clears throat> and obviously, you know, I have a lot of questions such as, what if I don't do that? Well, the answer is usually pretty clear by the time we get to the second exam, but I would say, just do that, okay? Just do, spend the time. I know the first few times you do it, it can be frustrating. 
because the process is kind of busy. And that's why I said you know, print it out and highlight all the key components because there are only a few key components in the processor. The rest are really only there to support the key components. So the idea is to identify the key components, see which one is active, and then start asking questions at that point. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to switch gear and talk about the lab today. You do have a lab today. <clears throat> the lab today is kind of fun in a way because you get to use the assembler. You get to play with the assembler and um, there are some questions in the assembler. I will even give you sort of the answer to one of those questions because I get asked a lot about that one. <clears throat> All right, so today's lab is uh, familiar, familiarizing with the TTP tool chain. And TTP, by the way, stands for Text Toy Processor. That's what you just saw earlier for the entire hour. We have been talking about the toy processor. It does have an access code, and the access code is not really surprising. It is just TTP ASM. Text Toy Toy processor assembly language. Okay, that's basically what it is. <clears throat> so that's your lab for today. It is due at the usual time of 1.20. Um, let me see. Oh, right. Okay, one of the questions is difficult to answer, so I'm going to give you an idea of how to answer the question because you know, I know that some people will be asking that question. So I'm going to put in some instructions here, LDI, A5. Now, we haven't really talked about that instruction today, so don't worry about it. Uh, JMP6 and then the whole instruction here. So don't worry about the LDI instruction or the JMPI instruction. Instead, focus on what is the content at location 04 at this point. Look at the assemble view, okay? And I'm asking you, what is the content at location 04? Okay, let me magnify just a little bit. So how do you answer the question? First thing you need to do is, what is column W, what is column X, and what is column Y? Okay, so you have to remember to ask those questions first. Column W is the address of the first byte on a row. Okay, so what that means is the first byte um, on row 1, which is a 60, is at location 00, zero. okay? Um, the next one is B4, okay? So B4 is the content at location 02, uh, 40 is the content at location 03, and 01 is the content at location 05. Did you notice that a few locations were skipped? Or did I? Because if column X is telling you the content at the location indicated by column W, what do you think column Y is trying to tell you? The value of the, 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 value of the byte next to the byte of column X, right? Yeah. Now, each location can only have one address. In other words, the byte indicated by column X has its own address, the byte indicated by column Y has its own address as well. Does that answer the question? Okay. Now, if you're not convinced about that, okay, there's another way to answer the question. The question was, what is at location 04, right? So a longer way to answer the question is go to the RAM file, okay, go to the RAM file, which is a sequential list of all those locations, okay? So you don't even have to download anything. Just do your counting. Location 0, location 1, location 2, location 3, location 4. So that's the other way to answer the question. All right? I think that's the only question in today's lab that is a little bit on the tricky side. And that was intentional because I want people to be thinking about this whole thing and go like, wait, how come the address is skipping sometimes and not skipping some other time? And every single time it skips, there's something in column Y. What does that mean to have something in column Y? You know, so that was the original intent of that question is to get people to think about you know, the assemble view and to be able to understand what is column W, X, and Y 
you know, re representing this respectively. But because there are so many questions usually associated with this particular question, I just decided to, eh, I'll just kind, kind of talk about it during the lecture. Because this way I don't have to answer the question more individually in the class. <clears throat> I think that's about it. Uh, the recording is still on, which is great. And I can just go ahead and upload it if there are no further questions. Any further questions? Okay, I don't see any. So you guys can go ahead and start with a lab. It should not take you a long time, even though it's a little bit on the tedious side. <clears throat> Sorry? Oh, I haven't unlocked it? Okay. Let me... It says it's published. Uh, let me double check. You have to scroll down to the bottom and click on one. I'll search for TTP. Yep, look for TTP. Yep. Familiarizing with the TTP tool chain, it is unlocked. Okay, am I looking at time dilation here? Have you been traveling faster than the speed of light? Did you get a speeding ticket this morning? <laughs> okay. Kind of weird. There's a little delay effect. Cool. All right, I'm gonna stop the recorder and up.